what is up ladies and gents, this is George Bean, and uh, finally I start off my Shocktober season uh, with a what is, uh, by revealing what is uh, one of my all-time personal favorite movies in my entire life, that is the 1975 thriller film, Jaws, which was directed by Steven Spielberg, based on a book by uh, Peter Benchley, and starring Roy Scheider, Robert Shaw, and Richard Trifus. Upon its theatrical release on June the 20th, 1975, Jaws was a massive, unexpected success, uh, both critically and financially. It had received positive reviews from critics who praised it for its suspense, characters, premise, musical score by John Williams, and direction. Box office wise, it had grossed over $470 million worldwide against a $9 million budget, resulting in it becoming the highest grossing film of all time at its time until it was dethroned two years later by Star Wars in 1977. And in important addition, Jaws was the film that had formally established Steven Spielberg as a film director and a force to reckon with in Hollywood. It has now been considered the, the prototypical summer blockbuster, with its release regarded as a watershed moment in motion picture history. And along with Star Wars, Jaws was pivotal in establishing uh, the modern Hollywood business model, which revolves around high, uh, high blockbuster box office returns from action and adventure pictures with simple high concept premises that are released during the summer in thousands of theaters and supported by heavy advertising. As a result, 43 years later to this day, Jaws is now considered one of the greatest films ever made and can now be found on many top movie lists ever, everywhere, and also in 2001, Jaws had been selected by the Library of Congress for pres preservation in the United States National Film Hi Registry, deemed it, who deemed it as being culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. The plot? The story follows Martin Brody, chief of police of Amity Island, who is suddenly faced with a situation involving a massive great white shark that starts to terrorize the island residents. He attempts to close the beaches uh, for the public safety, but is thwarted by the mayor, Larry Vaughn, who fears it will ruin the town's chances of making big bucks, just as the 4th of July holiday is fast approaching. But on the 4th of July, with the beaches wide open, the shark attacks again and kills two more people, and thus Brody, uh, with the help of oceanologist Matt Hooper and shark hunter Quint, sets out to hunt down the shark on its own territory, and so begins a cat-and-mouse-like hunt between the trio and the shark. As I've mentioned, this film was based on a similarly titled novel by author Peter Benchley, published in February of 1974. Peter Benchley had stated that the book was inspired by many ideas, the first idea was his long-time fascination with sharks, which he frequently encountered while fishing with his father in Nantucket. This resulted in him having the idea of a, quote, a story about a shark that attacks people and wouldn't go away, end quote. The second idea was him having read a 1964 news story about fisherman uh, Frank Mundus, who had caught a massive great white shark off the shore of Montauk Point, Long Island. The shark itself had actually weighed 4,550 pounds. And finally, the third idea was the story about also being partly inspired by the Jersey Shore shark attacks of 1916, of which there were four recorded fatalities and one critical injury from the shark attacks from July 1st to July 12th of 1916. But one very massive thing to mention are the differences between the book and the movie, uh, or mostly the changes that was made from the book when adapted into movie form. I believe the biggest change has to be the motive for Larry Vaughn wanting to keep Mayor Vaughn uh, wanting to keep the beaches open, 
in the book, it is revealed that he was in huge debt to the Mafia, who had pressured him to keep the beaches open in order to protect the value of Amdi's real estate, in which the Mafia had invested a great deal of money into. But also another pay change is that in the book, there is a huge subplot which involves Brody's wife Ellen having a secret affair with Matt Hooper, a subplot which, I kid you not, actually lasted 100 pages in my book. I shit you not, 100 pages. And when Brody finds out about it, the affair, he almost chokes Hooper to death out. Uh, to be honest, I am glad that they had chosen to completely remove this affair subplot out of the film, as it doesn't have anything to do with the shark situation, and it definitely would have dragged the movie down. But also, I think another big change has to be in how the three heroes shark hunt is depicted in the second half. In the book, they spend three days hunting the shark on York, or Kaboat. During the three days when night falls, the three heroes end up going back home uh, in their beds to return out to, at sea the next day, thus relieving any tension in them staying out at sea. But in the movie, this was changed to have them hunting the shark for two straight days and spending the night in between staying on the boat, keeping them on the waters during the entire second half. This actually helps keep the tension going throughout, as you wonder if the shark is ever going to be able to break the boat and cause it to sink, especially given the Yorka boat, boat is made entirely of wood. And most of all, one big change is how Quint and the shark die in the book. Quint dies similarly to how Captain Ahab dies in Moby Dick, you know, being pulled in by a rope tangled on his leg and tied to a harpoon jabbed in the shark. And so when the shark swims further down, Quint is pulled in and he, he thus drowns. And after the orca sinks, Brody waits for his fate as the shark hurdles towards him until the shark suddenly limps uh, limps onto Brody, having died from blood loss from its stabbing wounds, and it sinks down to the bottom. But Spielberg felt that this was a bit anticlimactic, and that instead opted to have it end with the shark being killed by an exploding air tank, to have the film end on an explosive blaze. And apparently, when Peter Benchley was having script meetings with Spielberg, Benchley had balked at Spielberg's air tank ending, claiming it was ridiculous. But Spielberg did not care and had wanted this ending in an attempt to get the audience to cheer. I'm sure all of you had seen a documentary about this film, as there are so many out there. Making this film was not an easy process for the cast and crew involved, mainly for the fact that they had actually shot the film out at sea on location near Martha's Vineyard, as opposed to shooting it in a controlled soundstage. Due to shooting out at sea, it was a nightmarish time. The weather was not in their favor. At one point, one of the orca boats had unexpectedly began to sink, and they, had ch and they tried to save the sound equipment. And most of all, the mechanical shark was not working. Accordingly, they had originally intended to show the shark much more pro prominently throughout the film, like in the book. But the mechanical shark kept breaking down, kept sinking into the water, not working as they had hoped. And so because of this, they had instead chosen to not show the shark too much, and instead keep it off screen, whilst keeping its presence known, which was further helped by John Williams' mute, ominous music score, to make it more suspenseful. But I mean, things were so bad during shooting that Spielberg himself had actually believed that his directing career was over before it had ever started. After this film, Spielberg had made it a vow to not shoot on location out at sea anymore, citing his having been an ambitious 27-year-old director for this, and had said that he would only shoot on a st studio sa stage from then on, or in a lake. It's kind of like how after ha having a nightmare shoot on Star Wars, George Lucas hadn't directed another movie until the prequel trilogy. 
and when directing those, he had decided to not shoot on location anymore, but instead sh shoot them on a studio stage in blue and green screen rooms. But if there's one person I need to bring up who may I may contribute to Salem Jaws, it has to be its end of editor, Verna Fields. Spielberg had praised Fields for her outstanding work in editing this film, and it's proven a lot that editing can help save a film from disaster. Depends on who the, the editor is. And yes, it was Verna Fields' editorial work that had really saved Jaws from being an, becoming an outright disaster, especially in maintaining the suspense of the shark. She had also worked as an editor on Spielberg's first major film, The Sugarland Express, the year before. And before that, She'd also contributed in the editing on George Lucas's film, American Graffiti. And of course, because of this film becoming a massive success, Universal Pictures had right away fast-tracked development on a sequel, but Spielberg w was not, as he had chosen to work on his next film, Cl Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Not wanting to wait for him to finish on this, that film, the producers had opted to hire another director, which was originally John Lee Hancock, who had written a much darker plotline showing Amity as a ghost town as a result of, from the shark attacks. But the producers felt that this plotline was too dark, and so they had replaced Hancock with Jeanette Zark, and with a reluctant Roy Scheider returning as Brody, the end resulting sequel, Jaws 2, was released in 1978, and focused on Brody having to deal with yet another shark as it terrorizes a group of teens out on their sailboats, among them including Brody's sons, Michael and Sean. The sequel was successful, but not as much as its predecessor, but it has now currently been considered by fans to be the best out of all the Jaws sequels. In an attempt to continue further interest in more films, the third film, Jaws 3, was given the 3D treatment after the success of 3D films such, such as Friday the 13th Part 3 and Amityville 3D. And with Roy Scheider not opting to return, Dennis Quaid plays a much older Michael Brody as he finds the SeaWorld Park he is working at to be terrorized by yet another shark. Released in 1983 and directed by Joe Owls, who was a production designer on the first two Jaws films, Jaws 3D was not very successful, and criticism was aimed towards the 3D appearing very ropey, especially during the final climax. But this did not stop uh, Universal from, from making one more sequel, Jaws the Revenge, which was released in 1987, and focus on Martin Brody's now widowed wife Ellen, as she finds yet another shark now, the, uh, now seeking revenge on her family while they're vacationing in the Bahamas with Mike, Michael Caine included in the cast. The film was given very scathing reviews, with many claiming the series to be running on fumes and the shark animatronic effects looking progressively worse. And so, the revenge is to this, this day the last Jaws film ever made, and there hasn't been any more Jaws films in the past 30 years since. But of course, there have been an endless series of shark films that are still being made, most of which you can find on the Sci-Fi channel. And yes, there are like at least more than 100 shark films out there, and just by reading their titles, some of them sound borderline ludicrous, like Ghost Shark or Snow Shark, or even Sharktopus, or even Sharknado, believe it or not. And back in 2010, I had heard of rumors of Universal thinking about doing a 3D, re 3D remake of Jaws with <laughs> Tracy Morgan playing the role of Matt Cooper. But Universal had outright dismissed the rumors and said that they were not remaking Jaws and have not come out about any such plans ever since. I happen to generally agree. 
I believe Jaws is a movie that does not need the remake treatment, uh, and should never be rem remade, especially given that Spielberg himself had said that a Jaws remake will never happen as long as he is alive. So we all don't have to worry about a Jaws remake anytime soon. Uh, e and even if Hollywood does ever announce such a thing, you can bet your ass that the entire internet will explode with backlash and break out their torches and pitchforks. Uh, based on how I remember it, I remember seeing the trailer ad for the VHS and DVD editions of Jaws on another movie I was watching at the time. And it did this by first showing the opening scene of the girl, Christy, being killed by the shark while swimming. And it then showed the VHS and DVD covers for the movie with the Jaws being playing. And it did interest me. And so I finally got a, got a chance to watch the film on TV. And it just amazed me. It did genuinely scare me as a little kid. It even actually did make me afraid to swim very far into a beach. It had happened at one point when me and my family had went on vacation at Panama City Beach for one summer. And when we, we were out on the beach, uh, they had tried to get me to swim in the water, but I didn't want to because I was afraid a shark might be near. So I'd say that Jaws did give me a small fear of going into beach waters. It had made me prefer swimming pools. Uh, and I am happy to know that I was not the only one who had such a fear, as it appears that when this movie was theatrically released, and even in the years afterwards, it had made people afraid of going into the water. That just shows just how effective this film really was, and still is. Roy Scheider does a stellar job as Martin Brody, the chief of police for Amity Island. He makes Brody a sympathetic hero to root for, as he is shown to be primarily concerned for the safety of the Amity residents, and even attempted to close the beaches, much to no success due to being overruled by the mayor. We do feel for Brody in his endeavors to protect his civilians from the danger of the shark. And when he decides to go out at sea to hunt down the shark, we desire for him to succeed in defeating the shark, and the fact that Brody had just started working as Amity's police chief after having just moved there from New York helps show how different he is from all the Amity Islanders and how they don't particularly trust him or even listen to him concerning the shark. Brody is not like this action hero. Uh, he's played as more like an everyman with a police badge, and I think this had helped him be sympathized by the audiences. Rich Dreyfus is fantastic as Matt Hooper, the marine biologist helping Brody in the case involving the shark. Dreyfus portrays Hooper with this sort of suaveness to him that makes him likable, and when the shark situation gets worse, he becomes more serious and even becomes concerned about other people's lives too. And we are also intrigued by his interest in marine biology and sharks, especially by the equipment he brings along for the ride, like his science stuff, even his shark cage. It shows how prepared he is in having to deal with the shark situation. This is certainly one of Dreyfus's best film roles in his career, alongside his next role as Roy Neary in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Robert Shaw has done an absolutely amazing job portraying Quint, the eccentric shark hunter obsessed with hunting down the shark. Quint is obviously supposed to be an homage to Captain Ahab and Moby Dick, but Shaw had played the role so well, he gave what could easily have been an Ahab wannabe a distinct voice of his own. And as Quint, you just cannot help but uh, find him to be so fun and joyful to watch, and it also leads him into having cultural clashes with Hooper, as Hooper is said to be an upper-class city man, while Quint is more of a working-class fisherman. So this causes some tension between the two characters, like when Hooper brings along his equipment for the boat trip, Quint calls him a half-assed astronaut, which is hilarious. 
and Quint has this great song he recites throughout the film, that being, Farewell and adieu to you fair Spanish ladies. Farewell and adieu to you ladies of Spain. I have that song so drilled into my memory, I can still recite all its lyrics at any moment's notice. I believe my favorite scene from him now has to be the scene involving Quint's speech about the USS Indianapolis, where he reveals that he was on that ship in 1945 on a return trip from deliver delivering parts of the nuclear bomb when it was torpedoed and sunk by a Japanese Japanese submarine, sending 1,100 men into shark-infested waters to swim adrift in for five days until rescue arrived. But I'll talk more about that scene later on. But really, the real star of this film is the shark itself, also referred to as Bruce by the crew, named after Spielberg's lawyer at the time. I will say, though the shark may possibly not have aged well in the past 40 years, but I still believe that it still looks fantastic. The fact that it was an actual mechanic mechanical animatronic makes it all the more better, as since this was like over 10 years or more before CGI, here the shark looks and feels very much real, and it still looks very frightening whenever it appears. So, the animatronic work is pretty done very well, and you can see why Spielberg would use the animatronics again uh, in his later film Jurassic Park, uh, albeit with CG, with also using CGI as well. But still, after all that hard work in trying to make this mechanical shark work, I'd say that even to this day, the hard work has paid out very well. The fact that it is kept off screen and its presence instead implied and felt by John Williams' score helps keep it a frightening threat throughout the film. Like, the less you see of the monster, the more scarier it becomes. The, an element that had also been repeated in not only the 1979 sci-fi horror film Alien, which was even at one point uh, pitched by its writers as Jaws in Space, but also the 1987 sci-fi action horror film Predator, which does not prominently feature its titular monster until like an hour into the film. But with that said, uh, the, the shark is, is a bit ropey during a couple moments during the movie, especially uh, the especially during the end when it continuously opens it and closes its mouth frequently like almost like as if it's a pac-man like and how its head is shaped shaped does seem a bit odd differently from how a shark's head is actually shaped but over and above all that the shark does still look very spectacular in the film, and the fact that it is barely seen for only a few moments uh, does help make it seem frightening and an actual threat in the film. Again, this movie had used to make me scared of swimming out into the beach waters and sh sharks. Whenever the shark shows up, I was always freaked out by it. Like during the scene, the second beach attack scene, when Michael when Brody's son Michael is in the pond with his friends, the shark knocks this one guy out of his boat into the water, and when the guy tries to climb up onto his capsized the boat, the there's this great uh, aerial shot of the shark swimming shallowly under the surface towards the guy, and when it disappears deeper in the water, the guy then su suddenly is pulled into the water, implying the shark to bitten him on the leg. It's a really freaky shot of the shark like that. It's like, it's our very first shark of the sh very first shot of the shark in full view, and right away it makes him seem all the more menacing when you see him under that shallow surface. I remember when I first saw that, I was like, <sighs> you know, as a little kid, almost gasped and freaking out. 
or at the end when the shark jumps out of the water and breaks the Bjorka boat's stern, causing it to sink. Uh, I had jumped in fright and was terrified for the characters. Uh, and when Quint ends up sliding down the deck towards the shark, I had actually screamed a little bit. Uh, that scene was really scary to watch for me as a young kid. And when Quint is killed by the shark, his screams of terror had honestly given me goosebumps when I heard those screams the very first time. And again, I do have a few, I'm gonna be quite honest with you. I do have a few favorite scenes. And again, my number one favorite scene is the Quint's Indianapolis Apolis speech scene. This scene was done so fluidly well. The way it was shot and lit, how the three actors are sitting around this small dining table with a lamp hanging over them as a source of light uh, in this darkly lit boat out in the middle of the ocean at nighttime was really good and memorable to watch. And the way Quint talks about being adrift in the water surrounded by hungry sharks uh, is really go goosebumpsy to listen to, especially when it is only told vocally by him and not shown in flashbacks. The lack of flashbacks maintains the atmosphere in that scene, and make, makes it feel all the more goosebumpsy and a bit, even a bit terrifying to watch. It almost kind of reminds me of like a campfire story, the type you'd hear when sitting near a fire or a lamp, and that's why what I see the scene as. It's possibly one of the very best campfire stories ever to be told in a movie. But if I had another favorite scene, it probably has to be when Hooper's in the shark cage. He has that poison dart to kill the shark with, and in the first few moments, the dun 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 dun, dun score begins to play at low volume. It's very low, but gets louder as the shark gets closer, and then fades back out when the shark swims away. And when Hooper readies his dart, the shark suddenly attacks the cage from behind. Big jump right. Uh, and it then tries to continuous, continuously break the cage open to reach for Hooper. And he's trapped in that little cage trying to get away. That scene was really freaky to watch as a kid. Even at one point, when the shark is almost touching Hooper and there's a small cloud of blood, I did not realize that Hooper was stabbing the shark. I thought that it had almost gotten Hooper and cut him. But when I saw the blood, I had almost gasped. But now I see that it was Hooper stabbing the shark with a little knife. But it's still really intense to watch that scene. And yet another favorite scene of mine has to be at the very end when Brody has his final fight against the shark just as the orca boat is sinking slowly sinking into the water. Brody had thrown a compressed air tank into the shark's mouth with a plan to fire a bullet at the tank to blow up the shark. As the shark stampedes towards Brody, he tries to hit the tank but keeps missing. So there's like tension as it gets closer to him. It's very suspenseful until he finally hits the tank, causing it to blow up and finally kill the shark. It was very exciting and cathartic to see the shark final, finally be defeated. But then of course Mythbusters had made an episode about the exploding air tank, and they had proven that it would not have done that, but instead would have shot out like a missile. But argh, who gives a fuck? We've got an explosion ki killing the shark. It's awesome. What I love about this film is how while the first half is a Hitchcockian horror thriller, with the shark terrorizing the island resort and killing people one by one, and the second half is more like an adventurous chase thriller, with our three heroes hunting down the shark in the faraway oceans. The second half, while still retaining the fright factor with the shark, feels a bit action-oriented when it involves them having to literally chase the shark down on the orca boat when they spear it with a barrel. And when they chase down the shark, John Williams blares the score with a fun, adventurous tone to it. So you are having it is a bit like a roller coaster ride, this movie. And yes, the music score by John Williams is still fantastic to listen to. 
this was the film, along with Star Wars two years later, that would put Williams on the map as the legendary composer we now know him as today. And he has scored at least 100 films in the past 40 years since Jaws. And again, John Williams is my number one favorite film composer. I will happily listen to any and all of his scores. They sound very memorable and operatic to them, and even whimsical at some points. In this this film, it is his dun 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 piece that has become very memorable. It plays out whenever the shark is nearby or for his presence to be known. I'm sure you might have that little piece of score as your phone ringtone. Admit it. So overall, I'd give Jaws a well-deserved rating of 10 out of 10 stars out of 10. Because after 40 years since its re initial release, it's, it is still a classic that has put Spielberg on the map as a director, while also effectively cementing the summer blockbuster thing we still now have with movies. As in this movie, have paved the way for summer blockbuster films among the likes of Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Jurassic Park, and most recently the Avengers movie from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. If you have not seen Jaws, if you have yet to have seen Jaws, then get out of that rock you've been living under, go grab it on DVD or Blu-ray, and have a fun time watching it. You will not be disappointed by it. So thank you for watching, ladies and gents. This is my first video for the Shocktober season, and to, so tune in very soon for mer many more reviews from me this Shocktober season. So thanks for watching again, and until then, I will see you all next time. Peace!